Hello and welcome to the Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And we're very lucky to be joined by a good friend of the Gaggle, a frequent guest, uh, Dmitry Babich, who, of course, uh, needs no introduction. He's a, a well-known political analyst uh, based in Russia. And um, the last time you were on, Dima, uh, the subject was Grigozhin. And yes. uh, he had begun um, releasing these uh, strange videos and interviews um, in which he appeared to be declaring war on the uh, Russian leadership, particularly the uh, military leadership. And we invited you on to try to make head or tail of it to understand what, what the hell is he trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess now after the events of this weekend, we're still a little puzzled as to what the hell was he trying to do. And uh, and we clearly, you know, what's what lies in the future is, you know, very very much in question. Uh, we do know that uh, President Putin will be delivering an address uh, tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, Moscow time. So sounds like it's going to be something important. We don't know what, but um, uh, obviously a lot of things are going on. What what's your immediate uh, impression about the events of the weekend? Uh, well, I spent uh, most of Saturday giving interviews, uh, mostly to Arab uh, television channels about what was going on. There was immense interest, European so so called, but uh, I was uh, pretty skeptical about their objectivity. So I preferred uh, the Middle Eastern <laughs> and uh, even the Indian channels. Uh, basically, I would say that the dramatism uh, was uh, overestimated. I mean. Maybe it, it looks dramatic if you just read the news headlines, you know. 25,000 armed men on big trucks are moving towards Moscow uh, with uh, anti-aircraft defenses and with a huge uh, battle experience. Uh, how motivated are these 25,000 people? What do they want to achieve? Do they have any support inside Moscow? I mean, my usual uh, question to the people who said, Oh, Putin is going to bomb them. Putin is going to destroy them. It's going to be a civil war. Uh, my usual uh, question was, okay, let's imagine they are successful. Let's imagine that they reached Moscow and they even entered the Kremlin. What are they going to do in the Kremlin? <laughs> uh, okay, there will be a bunch of phones, a bunch of uh, buttons. Prigozhin uh, obviously doesn't have any economic advisors, legal advisors. You know, it, it reminded me in a comical way of the story with that uh, Ukrainian fighter, you know, Nadezhda Savchenko. Uh, when she got elected into the Rada, a lot of people were very concerned, saying, oh, she's going to be in the Rada, she's a radical, she's going to have a bad influence. And, and my friends in Kiev said, she's just going to be bored there, because she comes to the Rada, what does she see there? A bunch of guys, you know, in nice suits and uh, ties, you know, with legal and economic education. You know, they, they remove one comma in a law, $33 billion goes to someone else. You know, they enjoy it. They know it. She doesn't know a thing about it, you know. So she will get bored. And yes, you know, the, the predictions of my friend were absolutely precise. She got bored, so she started to make it to make stupid noises, like she has a, a hand grenade in her in her uh, handbag, or uh, she may, uh, you know, shoot some deputies who are not doing their job. So in the end, she ended up in jail, where she spent a lot more time than in Russia, but then in Russian jail. But the West, of course, didn't give a damn about it. You know, they, they, they were so concerned when she was in Russian jail, but they completely lost interest. When Actually, I'd even... completely forgotten about that, Joe. <laughs> Prigozhin, if you look at him, and if you look at his statements, to me, he looked very much like uh, yes, the subject. So he looked like someone who was at war, who was maybe deservedly or undeservedly, who became famous thanks to the war. And uh, it seems to him that this is enough to have some political uh, significance. And most of his life, he was sometimes uh, a petty criminal, sometimes just a waiter, then a businessman, but a businessman very dependent on a lot of important people, you know, serving wine to George Bush, the 
Jr. when he came to meet, uh, you know, Putin's family in St. Petersburg. So he was always the waiter. He was always at your orders, you know. And suddenly, uh, because of his successes in Africa, because of his success in Ukraine, he becomes so important, and, and he he feels himself a military leader, you know. And and there are uh, a bunch of desperados around him who almost got killed, uh, you know, near near Bakhmut, and who may uh, who may be ready to risk their lives because uh, they don't value their lives too much. So uh, to me, it was very much a Cossack thing, you know. It reminded me of. Uh, Pugachev or Razin, you know, these uh, Cossack rebellions, you know. But, but Dima, uh, did, didn't Putin and Surovikin, they sounded very serious. They didn't They didn't take this to be a, a kind of a comic opera event. I mean, Putin, you know, he delivered that national address. I mean, Peter, you heard it live. And um, he was talking about 1917, in stab in the back, a betrayal, uh, you know, at the crucial moment for national survival. That that sounded to me uh, like they were taking this very seriously. So well, I, I will or, give you two two or, or explanations. Even if I could follow up from what George said here, was that a personal message to Bogrosian? Was that personal? Because I mean, well, because uh, George is right. I watched it. I mean, he was dead serious. Okay, but you know, I've talked to a lot of people since this started going on. And more, more and more people are saying this was just invented drama. So we can go to one extreme to the other. Your thoughts? Well, I am against uh, this uh, perception. A lot of people in Russia have it. Uh, they all feel like uh, they're, they're in, inside the Truman Show. You know, it's very popular in Russia to say that this was staged, that was staged. This was not real. No, everything was real, you know, and everything is real. Uh, things are now too serious to be staged. You know, it's very difficult now to stage something because you have cameras and you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, data, a lot of uh, information that just you know sifts out if you if you stage. Well, okay, right? but Dima, was he angling? Was Pogrosian angling on a deal from the beginning? Well, let me let me tell you why I think uh, Putin was serious and why Suravikin was serious. Well, the. the the first argument is Suravikin really values the lives of Wagner fighters, and, and, and he is really grateful to them for what they did. Uh, and and uh, uh, Prigozhin was a friend of Putin for a long time. Maybe not a, a very close personal friend, but he was just a loyal person, a, a loyal member of his surrounding. He was responsible for catering, right? It's like you go to you go camping, you know, every year for 20 years, and the guy who is responsible for providing the food, you know, he becomes sort of a member of the family. And you know that Putin is very, very grateful to his friends. Someone who did something good to him in his life, he always finds a way to, to, to be thankful to that person, and he never betrays the old friends. Uh, the other reason is uh, Prigozhin may be not a very serious figure, but Prigozhin tried to use a very powerful sentiment in Russia, which is not understood in the West, but which is indeed very dangerous. Uh, uh, this is what I have been telling my, uh, my, my interlocutors from the Arab stations from the beginning. The Western media uh, creates a narrative uh, that uh, the main opposition in Russia are the pacifists, you know, the people who don't want to fight, you know, the peace, people who don't want the war in Ukraine, who want a return to their... 22nd of February, or even to 1991 uh, uh, bonus. No, my impression is that the main opposition are the Russian patriots or super patriots who say the war is going on too slowly. You know, it's time to wrap it up. Hit Kiev, you know, hit the headquarters of, of Zelensky. They're getting their weapons from Poland. Hit Poland, you know, hit the, the airfield in, in uh, uh, Zeshu. Destroy the railroads, you know, destroy the bridges, destroy the bridges across Dnieper River. We'll rebuild them after or afterwards. Doesn't matter. Do something, you know. And, and this is a powerful, uh, powerful sentiment. Uh, uh, it has been somehow restrained by Putin's authority. But let me remind you that it was this sentiment that destroyed the Russian Empire in February 1917. Do you think Putin, then, oh, Dima, do you think then, just following up on what you just said, that he did enjoy support among the military. Did Prigozhin enjoy support among the military? 
not uh, I'm not sure about the military, but the people who wanted swifter, quicker action, who wanted victory tomorrow and not you know don't don't don't, don't make it too long. These people might might but, find but not but not among the military. You don't think the military were ready to follow? No, uh, look, not a single regiment, not a single uh, army unit joined him, right? And uh, and his uh, that uh, private military company is a very special thing uh, and uh, the population uh, as I told you um, uh, maybe what happened uh, is very good for Putin and for the Russian uh, uh, you know power machine in general because uh, if it had been someone more serious than Prigozhin, uh, and if it had been done in a less adventurous way it could have support in society but Prigozhin, it, it was kind of an abortive coup, right? You know, he went towards Moscow. He downed a helicopter and a plane, killing the pilots, right? In general, about 15 people died uh, because of that uh, action. Uh, people were scared. Uh, okay, maybe not the men, maybe not the analyzing part of the population, but you also have women, you have emotional people, you know, and not only in Moscow, but in uh, all these cities between Moscow and, and Ukraine. Uh, people in Bryansk were, were worried, people in Voronezh were worried, you know, that the, the, the column is moving towards us. So instead of, uh, instead of making this sort of thinking attractive, he made it unattractive. Yeah, I mean, since uh, uh, I, I watch all of these so-called Russia propaganda shows, and uh, I must tell you that uh, uh, since the beginning of the war, it was very popular in, in the shows of the people like Solovyov, uh, who I'm sorry was unprofessional enough to become kind of friends with Prigozhin publicly, right? Uh, the, the, these people allowed a lot of radicals to come there and say, I don't understand why we are not striking uh, Zelensky's headquarters. I don't understand why we are not striking the bridges. Now you don't hear any of that. At least, at least starting from Saturday, <laughs> because that that would sound like Prigozhin, right? Uh, so uh, the the conclusion that that most of the people made from this move is uh, obviously Shoigu and Gerasimov are real professionals. Uh, if please pay attention, they were remarkably calm and reserved. You know, Prigozhin insulted them and, and he made wild statements. He said that they struck at his uh, at his uh, positions, you know. Uh, obviously, the footage that he presented was uh, very unconvincing, most likely fake, you know. Uh, and, and I can't imagine Shoigu ordering a strike against uh, Prigozhin's troops. Uh, and uh, uh, Shoigu, instead of yelling in, in, in return, uh, as it would have been the case under Yeltsin, you know, when different people in Yeltsin surrounded yelled at each other, it was all very public. And uh, public accusations uh, flew around, and the 1993 disaster was part of the consequences of this kind of uh, leadership culture, we can call it leadership culture. The but, leadership but, culture. Yeah, but Surovikin, Surovikin issued a statement. So why Surovikin, but not Shoigu? Uh, well, uh, most likely because uh, uh, Shoigu, let me remind you, by his profession, he's not military. He is a builder, you know, and he has been working most of his life in this emergency ministry, which is very popular in Russia, which is very important, but it's not exactly military service. They, 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 they fought against uh, disasters, you know, the, the uh, power outages, uh, you know, explosions. All this they sort. went after a lot of the criminal elements when Putin came to power, which that also made them very, very popular. Exactly, but uh, uh, Surabikin is a professional military, and and he was obviously successful during this Ukrainian campaign. Not even Prigozhin would say anything bad about Surabikin. And please notice, Surabikin did not say uh, anything insulting. He just said, "Okay, you know, I respect you, Wagner fighters. We fought together. Think, think what you are doing. You know, don't don't join any criminal actions." So they they uh, their, their military leadership was. Uh, remarkably reserved and and uh, well behaved. In this well, Dima, Dima, uh, the, the big question for everybody outside of Russia is: Is Putin weakened by this? What's your opinion? Well, as I said, I, I think he's strengthened by this, not weakened. Uh, I, I I don't see uh, any kind of uh, discrediting element <laughs> in what happened. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, Prigozhin was his personal acquaintance, uh, probably a friend, 
well, people knew about it and people change, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, remarkably reserved and well-behaved men, when they feel like they, they, they have uh, the wind in their uh, sails, you know, and uh, suddenly your career is taken a uh, flip up, you know, that they can behave in a very strange way. People well, because the, 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 I mean, it was widely reported that, you know, the Wagner, Wagner group was being downgraded, being um, um, rotated out. Um, his prominence suddenly was um, diminishing. I mean, my my reading of it, living here, is that he's a hero on Telegram. Maybe not now, but up, right up to that point in time. I mean, he was very much a media sensation, and it was social media uh, where he was very popular. And and I, I think a lot of people analyzing in the West right before we convened. I, I don't know if you no noticed, George, that Politico has like 10, 15 different experts. OK, <laughs> I, I didn't, didn't take it very seriously. Close experts, unquote. Yeah, I mean, I, it's always interesting that uh, when when George and I, and I think I can throw in Dima, when we talk about Russia experts, it's never people in Politico. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Dima, I mean, again, I think I think you're on to something here because of the kind of personal relationship that Putin and Pogrosian had, that he sensed that he was, Pogrosian was speaking um, directly to Putin without using his name, because he's always been very respectful to the president. Do you, do you think that's part of it, too, is that, you know, this is kind of like man to man. Um, you know, we have to resolve this. Um, you know, I, I, I'm obviously not doing this against you. Um, but, you know, the animus that, that uh, Bogrosian had towards the military is widely known. We made a video about it. What do you think, Dima? Uh, well, uh, let me just first uh, answer the, the first question, which I think was the most important. Uh, did it weaken Putin or strengthen Putin? Why I think it strengthened him? Well, because it weakened the West. Uh, the West has been demonizing Prigozhin for many years. You know, they, Let me remind you, he was accused of bringing Trump to power. I mean, if you read the New York Times, it was Prigozhin. Uh, who brought Trump to power because Prigozhin owned that internet research agency, which was so terrible, you Putin's, know. Putin's case. Right. Putin's case. 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 Uh, Prigozhin's exactly. company, the Leia, and um, and but it turned out to be a dud. It turned disaster because you know they, they, he did, he didn't realize that you, if you indict a corporation, the corporation can still come to court and be represented by counsel. They just figured, well, no one from uh, Wagner is going to show up in court, and we're going to have a wonderful you know conviction without a trial. But that turned into a disaster uh, for Mala. Anyway, continue, Dima. Well, well uh, if I remember correctly, Prigozhin was pretty successful in foreign courts, unexpectedly for me. You know, he, he sent lawyers there and he yeah. made foreign media apologize, which I think is very important because it shows that actually you can find you can fight these guys. You know, if you, well, if I mean, you like, as, as, as George said, I mean, the, the process is called discovery. And so the the um, the defendant, in this case, um, uh, uh, Bogrosian's uh, Wagner, they oh, had the right to see what the evidence is against them. And and then the Mueller people realized that there's not, there's oh, no- I think it was not even there. Wagner. I think it was not even Wagner. I think it was this internet research agency okay. and uh, his other company. You know, right. Yeah, it was. Yes, company. it was internet research agency. That's right. But I think it was uh -huh. the the mistake he made is that he indicted a corporation. So a corporation doesn't have to show up in person. If it was an individual, an individual has to show up before he presents a defense. But here, if it's a corporation, they can just simply send a lawyer, and a lawyer yeah. does the demand for discovery and everything yeah. else. Of course, Mala uh, didn't have anything. I think the reason why uh, these idiots uh, from uh, uh, you know the United States. Uh, 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 why they sued the corporation because they didn't like the uh, Russian name Prigozhin. So, so instead of Prigozhin, if you sue IRA, you know, Internet Research Agency, his other company was called Concord. You know, they it was basically in catering business. That sounds much easier, right? Almost like Burisma. So uh, basically, uh, they, they wanted more publicity and it failed them. Uh, but uh, uh, what I wanted to say is, so the West... Uh, uh, after demonizing Prigozhin for nine years, suddenly uh, just his statement against Putin was enough to make him almost a hero. I mean, uh, several media outlets in the West started saying uh, almost positive things about him, like uh, yeah. Le Figaro wrote, uh, Prigozhin, 
Is he going to oust Putin? You know, uh, and the subtext was if he oust Putin, then he is someone positive. Well, and uh, also, Dima, if I can interject something that George mentioned to me a, a couple of days ago, is that the we 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 went into this kind of unicorn world because it, it appeared that Pogrosian was mimicking CNN. So I mean, yes. now everything is turned upside down and inside out. Sorry for the interjection. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, and uh, and uh, uh, the the Russian opposition guys were stupid enough. I mean, Khodorkovsky was stupid enough to solidarize with Prigozhin completely. You know, uh, Khodorkovsky said, "Oh, this guy is a hero." You know, and and uh, the reason why he did it, I understand, because uh, Khodorkovsky himself has a criminal background. Despite his glasses and uh, yeah, nice Steve smile, look, yeah, he, right. he's a former he's a former petty criminal, you know, in, in, uh, from the mid eighties, and uh, and Prigozhin has roughly the same roots. Uh, uh, lots of people have such roots, and uh, most of them have grown up and become much more respectful. But uh, uh, Khodorkovsky, I, th I think, immediately felt that adventurist uh, strain in him, you know, that. Uh, 80s, 90s feeling which unites them, and uh, and uh, uh, obviously some people had their stomachs turned up to upside down by this sort of uh, behavior, but not Khodorkovsky. Khodorkovsky is a, an adventurist himself, so he felt a, a, a brother soul in, in, in Prigozhin. I think that was Dima, what the is, reason. What is, is going to be the fate of Prigozhin? What do you think is going to happen to him? I think he will just uh, lead a quiet life in Belarus uh, because. Uh, uh, okay, uh, put yourself in Putin's shoes. There is no other country where you can oust Prigozhin, right? Uh, keeping him in Russia is embarrassing. Uh, you know, Belarus is a quiet place uh, where he won't uh, have uh, uh, even an opportunity to use the money. He probably has still a lot of money in cash uh, or in some other form that he can use. But in Belarus, it is largely useless because uh, the government there controls its territory much better than in an average <laughs> Russian region. So I think uh, I think so, what's, so what's, he, what's, he going to to, what's he going to live off in Belarus if he can't use the money? What's he going to do? Uh, well, he he may uh, he is a businessman, a successful businessman. He may start some kind of small business in Belarus, maybe a few small businesses. Um, first, he will have to come to his senses because well, obviously right now he is almost delirious, you know, he, he felt like he was uh, making kings, you know, in Ukraine and in Russia after that huge battle uh, around Bakhmut, obviously. Uh, I think uh, this is very much uh, an emotional affair. And uh, also even the aesthetics of his Wagner group was, uh, was getting strikingly different from the aesthetics of the Russian army in general, because in the Russian army, the tradition is, even if you make advertising for joining the army, it's about service. You know, you serve your country. And Prigozhin's ads, they were about, they were almost Nietzsche, you know. They were about Superman. You are going to be a Superman who can, uh, you know, fight thousands of people, risk his life, lose his life. Uh, he's completely, it, it, it was uh, very individualistic, very... Uh, I would say, uh, very uh, unadapted to the Russian audience. Uh, people here are not used to this sort of attitude to that. The big question is, I think uh, Peter raised it, what's going to happen to Wagner? And in general, does Russia need uh, private uh, security companies like, like Prigozhin's? I mean, formally, officially, Prigozhin's company was just a security firm. It was a частная охранная предприятие. Uh, someone you hire if you want to protect yourself from yeah, uh, personal enemies yeah. or, or your property. Yeah, but in reality, of course, it was a military company, and uh, and it was modeled after the Western military companies. I don't know how much it resembled uh, Blackwater. I think Blackwater was a lot more sinister in its ways, but uh, I think the idea was very simple, and the idea was very, I'm sorry, ultra liberal. Uh, some people at the top in Russia, they decided, okay, Americans have missiles, we must have missiles. Americans have, uh, you know, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, we must have weapons of mass destruction. Americans have private army companies, we must have private armies. This is the way you do it, you know, in, in modern world. And indeed, maybe from a legal point of view, having a company like Wagner in, in Africa is is useful because 
you don't face the same legal uh, challenges. You know, you, you're not responsible for the lives of each one of these men. Uh, but, they but get their but, money. But weren't they particularly, they, they were quite effective. I mean, they were quite effective in Syria and they were quite effective in uh, West Africa. And I think they were quite effective in Central African Republic. So it's actually quite an effective way for Russian diplomacy to be able to send these uh, private armies to help out uh, leaders who are well disposed towards Russia. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of quid pro quo uh, you know, and sending them there. Interestingly, so like, I, I think, George, the, the upshot, though, is that it's good for West Africa, for, for Mali, but don't have it in Russia. For Russia. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you, if you look closer, you can see that most of this uh, hysteria around Wagner in Africa, it was not created by Russian media. Russian media actually reported very little about it. It was created by the French media. And I, I don't know how much of it is due to success of Wagner and how much of it is due to unpopularity of France and, and its military in that area, you know. Uh, it's uh, very, it was very hard for Russians to understand that how can, how can France be unpopular? Uh, <laughs> because the Russians have usually a very good attitude to the French. But France is unpopular in, in Mali, in Senegal, in, uh, in uh, Cameroon, in all of these countries, former colonies. And uh, not only because of the colonial past, but also because of some of the mismanagement uh, that, that Sarkozy and others uh, brought to Africa in the last few years. I mean, Cote d'Ivoire was a disaster. We, we, we don't hear any, any success stories. We haven't been hearing them for the last 20 years in Africa about French presence there. Only there, the was, there was one thing president. that, you know, just uh, uh, about his activities, and this is something Prigozhin brought up, a very sore point that he has against Shoigu, and that's about what happened in Syria, where the Wagner group had the Americans on the run, and, uh, and, and the Americans were panicking. They called Moscow and asked Moscow to restrain the Wagner group, Moscow got on to Wagner, restrained them, and then, of course, as Americans do, boom, they just pummeled them, bombed them uh, to smithereens, and something hundreds of these uh, Wagner fighters were killed. So you can understand, you know, Prigozhin really was really pissed off about what happened. Uh, did, well, you... uh, that, that, that story about Americans bombing uh, Wagner fighters in Syria is very murky. I mean, there are all kinds of rumors about it. We don't know all the details. Obviously, the, the Russian government decided not to make it public, even though I think if someone is interested in not making it public, it is the United States. Because after all, it was not Americans who were killed, it was uh, Russians, uh, but uh, very special Russians. I mean, the, the, the idea of a private, uh, a private security company, uh, just like with Blackwater in Iraq, the idea is the state like outsources some of its... Uh, most difficult uh, uh, jobs to, to the private industry. And in a way, it was uh, fair because I, I think uh, uh, what the Soviet Union did was not very fair when we sent uh, thousands of uh, conscript soldiers, you know, uh, to places like Angola or Mozambique, sometimes without documents. I mean, I, I interviewed these people. Uh, and, uh, this, and if they died, you know, the family has got almost nothing. I think that is unfair. Uh, with Wagner, these people risked a lot, but their families got huge amounts of uh, money. Even the pro-Western uh, investigative journalists who tried to uh, blacken uh, Wagner and who found the families here, usually when they found the families, they found out that the families got $60,000, $70,000. That's a substantial amount of money, you know, which, which uh, the earlier generations of Russian soldiers in such places wouldn't dream of, you know. Well, you know, David, so, it's, it's very interesting because that's something that I have noticed, particularly when we made our first video about this topic. And as a, it is my want, I, I ask around what people think of these, of this person, this group and all of that. And it, it very, it struck me as very uh, kind of a snooty attitude. I mean, Moscovites, well, you know, you know, they kind of hold their nose. Well, at least they're, you know, fighting. They're, you know, they, they're good fighters, okay? But they didn't have much of a opinion, high opinion of these people. They didn't have a high opinion of Pogrosian at all. As a matter of fact, he was very, for a lot of people I know, he was a very clownish figure. And that's what made The weekend really scary because this kind of clownish figure, he's got 
arms, you know? I mean, that because the initial reaction, and I was here, was like dread, shock, okay? Um, but I did a live on RT when it was going on, and I said it'll be over in a day, which I ended up being proven right. But, you know, the there's this attitude and, and then you throw in this social media and it's what, what, what you got, I guess you guys called class nationalism. You know I mean? It's, it's, exactly. it's right. And that's what it is. And, and it, people in Moscow, very snooty, very rich uh, city, um, very expensive place to live, very much looked out upon these guys. Uh, you are exactly right. And I think this is one of the reasons why Putin was rather strengthened by this uh, whole story and, not weakened because um, let me show you the difference with 1917. In 1917, Russia was indeed toppled not by Bolsheviks initially. You know, in February, it was toppled by the people who spread the rumors that uh, uh, the Empress, uh, being an active German, works for the German intelligence. You know, Boris Putin is a German agent. The Tsar doesn't know anything. The emperor is good for nothing. He, he just drinks and doesn't pay attention. Uh, th there is some kind of a cable from, uh, you know, the Tsar's uh, estate in Tsar's case, going straight to Wilhelm and his, uh, his German general staff. All that sort of nonsense was spread, which was uh, believed by, by a lot of people. And the reason why it was believed because some really, really serious people spread it. I mean, Boris Savinkov, whom even Churchill had huge respect for, he was involved in that, right? Uh, the Duma was not like the Duma that we have now. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Duma had some, some of the most uh, talented manipulators, uh, real you know, uh, public figures who undermined the Tsar's authority every day, you know, using foreign media, using all kinds of... And society was so inexperienced. So when you have, on, on, on one side, you have Savinkov, you know, you have Kerensky, who was still a very good public speaker, right? Uh, when you have all of these angry soldiers who say, you know, we're not uh, getting enough attention that time for nothing. And on the other side, you have the, the, the figure of the Tsar, who was obviously not uh, had a hands-off approach to ruling the country, and the Tsar had been in power for 22 years, uh, so the, the system crumbled. And now you're absolutely right. Uh, the, this abortive coup, whom do we have at the source of it? A clownish figure. A clownish figure, demonized by the West. <laughs> Uh, uh, also, the, the, who are the so-called uh, peacemakers? Who are the peaceniks? They are uh, Navalny and his gang. People actually openly, openly, uh, uh, openly toting up to the West. Uh, absolutely open foreign agents. Uh, so uh, the times have changed. One hundred years ago, but, yeah. But what's uh, interesting, the, the, though, the and this... had much more powerful uh, enemies and much more talented enemies. Right. But what's interesting, though, is that um, uh, Prigozhin really didn't come up with an agenda. I mean, if you're going to have a coup, what's your political agenda? I mean, you know what? What, what now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. What now? Like, exactly. We, you know, what, what? How? How would you be different? How? How? You know, what changes do you want to see in uh, Russia? How would you win the war? You know, what, what is it you're going to do that Putin, Shoigu, and Gerasimov haven't done? So he didn't really have any of that. I mean, he was just complaining. Oh, you didn't give me enough artillery. I didn't get enough shells. I didn't get enough support. It was just a lot of whining, but without an agenda. I mean, you can't really have a coup without some sort of a, an, an agenda that you're going to enact once in power. And on top of that, there was no institutional support at all. Zero. No, in, you know, it wasn't the military. It wasn't the, uh, the, the intelligence community. It wasn't the police. It wasn't teachers. It wasn't the strawberry sellers on every corner. It had no institutional backing at all. Well, okay, maybe some taxi drivers. Uh, okay. Uh, talk to. <laughs> no, they, never they underestimate. Be, never they, underestimate them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there are always uh, discontent people. There are always people who suspect the worst, and yep. uh, they they could listen to Prigozhin, but to sacrifice their lives for him, you know, or to to take a risk, even even to give money to him, I don't I don't expect anyone to do it. And that, that's what we 
That's what we have been uh, starting with. Uh, okay, if Prigozhin comes to the Kremlin, so what? You know, <laughs> what's he going to do there? That was the question I asked, and I think George uh, formulated very well. Now, exactly, no agenda, no ideas. You know, and, and the same story with uh, the Russian opposition in general. Uh, when you ask them, what are you going to do? We're going to do things exactly like in the West. Okay, uh, how can you do it in, in right. the current situation? It's not realistic. Right. No, no, we're going to do it exactly like in the West. And we're going to end the war. And we're going to have peace with Ukraine forever. And, and we're going to have peace with the West forever. Well, the, the, the problem is that Putin and his people believed in this theory. Uh, I think they initially believed in it. It was very popular theory among Russian intelligentsia in the 80s that Russia has no enemies. Just uh, some discontent neighbors who were uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, repressed by Stalin. So we just have to apologize for Stalin, you know, uh, say that we're friends and life will continue. Uh, and that was simply wrong. I mean, it took us 30 years to understand that this picture was very nice. It's very attractive. It's very rock and rollish, you know. Uh, you can you yeah, can see a few know, songs about it, but it's not real. You know, Tim, I need your opinion on this uh, because I'm only going by from what I can see and talk to people around me. But you know, there's I think there's this perception. You know, there's well, we both know here in Moscow that at least twenty percent, maybe more, don't like Putin. Okay, and they're very open about it. Very open about it. Okay. Yeah. But it's not dangerous. Yeah, but given the choice, you know, so you want to switch out these guys for Pogrosian. And, you know, these same people, I, this is my impression, the, the, the people that dislike Putin the most in Russia are the most successful or very successful people. And, and, I, and that has always been my critique back to them is that, you know, yeah, he's been around for a long time. But you've done very well during that time as well. So, I mean, that's something, you know, that these liberals in Russia tie themselves up into, into a pretzel because they really don't know how to um, answer that. And so, you know, as I was sitting in a very posh cafe watching Telegram, I was thinking, these people are going to fight for this lifestyle. They're not going to they're not going to follow this guy. No way. They may not like Putin, but they're not going to follow that guy. No way. You're absolutely right. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, the experience of 1917 shows us that That's right. you can be a good, successful businessman, but it doesn't mean you can run the country. Uh, I mean, the, the, the provisional government was a disaster politically. They, they uh, just destroyed the system of uh, uh, administering anything in, in Russia at the time, you know. But they were a very good businessmen. And that was a shock uh, for their supporters. I mean, the liberals, the so-called Constitutional Democratic Party, they expected these people, Maklakov, Tereshenko, they expected them to be very good, powerful uh, state managers uh, since they were successful in their companies. No, no, they were successful with their companies, but they were very bad at running the state. And yeah. uh, the same story here. I mean, it's amazing how these people, I, I, sometimes I really think that uh, maybe uh, we, we don't have a very fair system of getting rich. How can you get rich while being so stupid? I mean, in, in, in political thing uh, affairs, I, I don't know. You know. So Dima, uh, what about um, the analogy? I don't know, what, what do you think of the analogy of um, Vlasov? I mean, Vlasov had been a very successful a uh, Red Army officer, very patriotic. He was uh, very decorated um, and was well regarded by the Red Army. And then he switched. He switched sides and uh, was essentially ready to destroy his country. Um, and, you know, do you think something like that has happened to Prigozhin that he just simply, you know, became so filled with rage and hatred in the way Vlasov was against, against the communist system that he was ready to work mm. with the enemies of Russia. No, I'm not sure. E even though his uh, interview, which he gave on the eve of this uh, uh, pronunciamento, as the <laughs> Spanish call it, right? The military coup called pronunciamento. Uh, he gave a speech which sounded like repeating Ukrainian propaganda. Uh, yeah. Not a speech, but an interview. You know, like I, oh, I call it uh, um, uh, CNN talking points uh, right. from right. exactly. You know, like all these talking points, like uh, 
uh, DNR and MNR were all corrupt. Uh, Russia wanted to rob them, all that nonsense. Russia lost a lot of money on Eastern Ukraine. It certainly didn't get any money from Donetsk and Lugansk. It may get in the, in the future, you know, when when we uh, rebuild the country and when we are together, but no, no, now it's just a complete loss. And not in Putin's lifetime. Uh, it, 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 so so why, isn't the, why isn't the Vlasov analogy appropriate? Well, uh, Vlasov, I think, was a pretty cynical man. There are no indications. And he was a real military he, man as well. Exactly, he was a real military man. Yeah, but great, and great man as well. Biography, yeah. that, uh, there are no indications that he had been opposed to Stalin before 1942. He was absolutely loyal. He was never uh, a member of the Tsarist army. He was in the Red Army from the beginning, owed all of his career to Soviet system, right? And uh, and uh, he was not a believer. He was not a, a believing Christian. He he tolerated this in his troops uh, during the war against the Soviet army. But he himself, there are no indications of him being an Orthodox man. So uh, his decision in 1942 to surrender was very simple. You know, his army was defeated. He failed to to break through to Saint Petersburg to Leningrad. Uh, he was on the occupied territory and uh, uh, saving his life and and uh, willing to have a nice life, he switched to the German side. He was not alone. There were 60 generals, who 60 Soviet generals who worked uh, with Hitler. Uh, but I, I think that there is a difference. You know, the emigrants who worked with Hitler, people like Krasnov, older generation, they they were avenging themselves for the cruelties of Bolsheviks during the civil war. A lot of them had their children killed, like that uh, writer Ivan Shmelov. Uh, Zlasov had nothing of that. You know, he was uh, I don't even know what uh, if he had any relatives. You know, and uh, certainly none of his relatives suffered in the civil war. Uh, so uh, he 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 was just saving his life. In and, and uh, well, also he, he, to, to go back to Pogroshin, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be crass and I don't want to simplify it, oversimplify it. But in, the more I think about it is that Pogroshin just saying, let's make a deal. <laughs> and he got a deal. And maybe that's it. Well, maybe he just wanted his five minutes of fame uh, and he got them. Uh, and uh, he's alive. And uh, I don't think he will be a poor man in Belarus. So uh, his fate is not tragic. But what, what happens now, do you think? Um, I mean, for instance, I mean, will, do you think Putin will announce the firing of Shoigu and Gerasimov tonight? No, no, no. no. I think that Putin will find a replacement for uh, Prigozhin to head Wagner. Maybe they will rename the company. Uh, but uh, no, in Putin, I am pretty sure these people will keep getting what was promised to them. The, the families of the dead ones will keep getting what uh, what what is due to them. So uh, uh, I wonder how that will be done. May, you know, under precaution, it was done in cash because they were afraid of uh, probably foreign monitoring or uh, financial transactions. Uh, now maybe. Maybe a part of it will be in cash, part of it will be done by more legal uh, means. Uh, I think part of the reason why Prigozhin got out of control is because he had all of these amounts of uncontrolled cash. You know, He had suitcases of uh, dollars and rubles, and, and that was just unbelievable. Well, I, I can tell you, uh, this is a problem, I think. It's a general problem in Russia. I don't think it comes from Putin. I think it comes from the lower level. There are some people in Russia who have more political rights than the others. And strangely, uh, contrary to what the West thinks, these are the so-called liberals. For many years, these were the so-called liberals. I mean, uh, Ksenia Sobchak, she could say such things about Putin and about the state in general, which a guy in the street uh, would, you know, he would have problems at work if he, if he said it. Uh, but uh, there were people like uh, Mironov who had this Just Russia party. I mean, he had terrible people like Ilya Panamaryov inside his party saying terrible things. You know? and, and, but because Mironov has been a personal friend of Putin and everyone knew he was from St. Petersburg and he, was, he had been the head of, of the upper chamber of parliament, uh, I think uh, police and others were just afraid to touch 
the people who had some connection to him. So in the same way, when people ask, why, why, did, why was Prigozhin allowed to say such things? Does he have support of Putin? I can tell you, no, he may not have support of Putin, but just, you know, the lower levels of Russian bureaucracy, they still think that someone who has connections to the boss, he has more rights than you and me. You know, he, he belongs to the caste of the untouchables. And in reality, they are not untouchables. Before, several, I can give you several examples. There was General Cherkesov, who was also a KGB colonel or general and who was uh, acquainted with Putin. And for some time, he headed the Russian anti-drug agency. When he started, I'm sorry, to get mad, you know, to, to just to freak out, making all sorts of stupid statements in the press, uh, Putin tolerated for two months. You know, he gave him a chance to stop it. He didn't. So Cherkesov was ousted and uh, his political career was ended. Uh, that, that, that banker, Sergei Pugachev, who, who told everyone, I am Putin's personal banker. And, uh, and uh, the Western media believed that. I don't know why Putin didn't cut it short earlier, because maybe it was just not reported to Putin. But Sergei Pugachev kept saying for 10 years that he was someone very important, you know, someone or, uh, that could not be touched. And then he cracked up to be just a very common operator. You know, he got bankrupt, fled to uh, Britain, later to France. It turned out that he uh, simply could not service his debts. You know, now he's living in France somewhere, uh, using somehow the part of the money that he managed to hide from being stolen. It's. Uh, it sounds know, like, Dima, what you're saying is that Putin gives them enough rope. Yeah, it's uh, it's just uh, these people should not be overestimated. When they say they have a direct connection to Putin and they are untouchables, in most of the cases, this is not true. Uh, and, uh, and But Prigozhin uh, managed to create that myth about himself. And, you know, sometimes I just get the impression that uh, maybe Putin or his people around him, they don't pay enough attention to Russian press. Maybe they react to Western press sometimes yeah. even more uh, more uh, quickly and uh, more pointedly than to some articles in the Russian press. Prigozhin just used the Russian press for his own purposes, creating that Superman image for himself, which he oh, didn't the, deserve. He, may, he didn't. He had so much help. He had so much help on social media. It was. Mm -hmm. it, I was astounded by it, and I was really turned off by it too, because you know. I, I, I don't want to speak as a Russian because I'm not, but that's not really Russian tradition, okay? He was very voiceful. He was um, 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 he was always in your face, which is so odd um, living here for so long. And, and, and considering he was just kind of in this gray area also, which he took advantage of because it was a contracting company, made it even more worse. And like I've already said, everybody around me just held their nose when his name was mentioned. Yes, yes, but uh, this is the problem, you know. Uh, so the most despicable people, uh, they, they got immune in Russia from prosecution and from just common decency because people thought they were connected to someone uh, high up in the government. I, I don't think I think, uh, um, I don't think, for example, Ksenia Sapchak deserved all the attention that had been paid to her. She, she certainly was not a danger to Putin. She certainly was not a great thinker. Uh, she just made stupid statements and uh, everything yeah, it, she it, says it, is very shallow. George and, George and I it, it kind of reflect upon is, you know, you know, for an American politician say today, I was against the Iraq war. Oh, that's real courage. And sometimes <laughs> it's the same thing. She says something like, oh, wow, she's really courageous. And, you know, but there's no downside because nobody takes her seriously. OK, I, I think it's on the same. So, Dima, um, what what happens now? I mean, do you think there will be any kind of personnel changes? I mean, do you think um, Shoigu, Gerasimov, are they staying on? Will there be a change in strategy? I mean, do you see any 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 changes now at, at the top? Mm, may, changes may happen, but not because of Prigozhin. Uh, right now, as far as I can understand, Russian defense was pretty successful. And it was not due to Prigozhin, it was due to, I'm sorry, Gerasimov and Shoigu, who somehow managed to make several lines of defense. And uh, they found a way to use uh, 
front aviation so that uh, the Ukrainians would not, uh, you know, they when they take some villages, it is usually at a huge cost because the aviation destroys them when they get out of their shelters. So uh, somehow, even the Western media admits it, that uh, uh, the Russian army learned a lot during this year. And I think part of the credit can go to the current uh, uh, Ministry of Defense and, and the generals. Uh, the big miscalculation about, about the ability of Ukrainian army to resist that was made in 2022, let me remind you that the, the, the American, uh, not only the American media, but obviously the American special services and, and the military specialists, uh, obviously uh, they, uh, they, they um, uh, made the same mistake. They underestimate, hugely underestimated the Ukrainian army. Okay. Well, Dima, this was a really interesting and very insightful uh, discussion. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time to join us and uh, offer us your insights. We always appreciate them. And I know the fellow gagglers do. So thank you so much, Dima. Uh, thank you, thank you Peter. And remember, if you yeah, go. You want to say something, Peter? I'd like to speak to you after this. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.